It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of assembling ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us concerning the things we know. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5, verse 10. Galatians chapter 5, verse 10. I am confident in the Lord that you will change your mind. Change your mind about what? Legalism. In fact, I don't know if it has repent there or not in your Bibles, but uh, metanoia O means change your mind. I am confident in the Lord that you will change your mind, but the one who is confusing you will pay the penalty, whoever he may be. And this is the Apostle Paul addressing the Galatians who have been led astray by legalism. And what the Apostle Paul is saying is you don't get away with trying to keep people from the Word of God, from truth, from doctrine, or from grace. You don't get away with it. And the penalty will be the sin face to face with death. When the Apostle Paul offers a suggestion such as this, the penalty face to face with death. And the penalty will be the sin face to face with death. But the one who is confusing you will pay the penalty. And what are they being confused about? Grace. They're being led astray from doctrine. And they are being led astray by a bunch of people who are envious, who are jealous, who want to be top cheese spiritually. And therefore, the Apostle Paul issues this edict. And this will come to fruition eventually. So now Galatians 5.11. Now, royal family of God, believers, if I am still preaching circumcision... And this is a tense of if that means I am not. If I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross is rendered null and void. Now why does he say this? Because the legalists came down from Judea. And they came down and they said, you know what, Paul really does teach that you need to be circumcised. He teaches that. He just never told you about it, but really he believes what we're saying. And then he says, well, if I truly believed in circumcision, then why are they still persecuting me? And he's saying, I don't believe in circumcision for salvation. So now, royal family of God, if I'm still preaching circumcision, but I'm not, why am I still being persecuted? That's a good question. And one that should make the Galatians think. They should start thinking. Well, they've said that you do preach circumcision, yet they persecute you for not teaching it. So I guess you're right, and they're the ones lying. And that's the conclusion they would have to come to. Galatians 5.12 I wish the legalist, is who it's referring to, I wish the legalist who trouble you would go ahead and castrate themselves. And the Apostle Paul hits them real hard right here. This is the most sarcastic verse in the Bible, more than likely. I haven't found one more sarcastic than this. And he's really laying it on the line. He's saying, look, these people are persecuting me. On the one hand, they say that I teach circumcision, but I don't. And on the other hand, they persecute me for not teaching circumcision. So I wish they'd just go ahead and cut their thing off. It's exactly how it comes out. Exactly what he tells them. And this is something the Galatians would understand because under some of their pagan religions, if they wanted to be a priest in their pagan religion, they didn't just circumcise themselves. They cut off their whole uh, sexual organ. The men did. And that's how they became priests. And many of them died after this operation. And so they went very far in terms of their former religion in trying to be holy in their own mind, trying to be a priest in their own religion of polytheism. And so they were familiar with castration. In fact, some of them may have even been castrated themselves. So when he goes on and says, 
you're going in for circumcision now, but do you remember your old religion? People would cut their whole thing off. And he's saying right now to them, well, I wish those people who were leading you you astray would go so far as to just cut it all off. Very sarcastic. And this is Paul's harshest piece of sarcasm in the Bible. And he's trying to tell them salvation's not by circumcision. And the legalist said cut off a little piece for salvation. And Paul said, well, why stop there? If you can be saved by cutting off a little piece, cut off the whole darn thing. And it might be a bit embarrassing, but it's biblical. It's right there in the Bible. And it's sanctified sarcasm. Paul is in fellowship. (coughs) Most people today, if some preacher got up and said something like that, they would get scared or terrified or wonder what in the world you're preaching. The Bible. Preaching the Apostle Paul. So now moving on, Galatians 5.13. For you were called to freedom. That is spiritual freedom. And that spiritual freedom is found in the filling of God the Holy Spirit. That freedom is found in learning the Word of God. It is not freedom to indulge in your old sin nature, but it is freedom in order to live your spiritual life. For you were called to freedom, the four spiritual mechanics. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity to indulge in your old sin nature. Why did Paul even bring this up? Because all the legalists from Judea came down and said, Paul teaches salvation by grace, and Paul teaches that all you have to do is name your sins after salvation, and that means that he's trying to give you a license to sin. And what he's doing is he's trying to make you all indulge in the old sin nature. So Paul says, no, that's not my purpose. The purpose is freedom. The purpose is spiritual freedom. But only do not use your freedom as an opportunity to indulge in your old sin nature. In other words, freedom is not a license to sin. It is a license to live your spiritual life. It's a license to name your sin to God, 1 John 1, 9. And it's a license to be filled with God the Holy Spirit, but definitely, definitely not a license to sin. But through virtue love serve one another. The last phrase in Galatians 5.13, but through virtue love serve one another. Now what this indicates is Paul has already taught them something about impersonal love. He's taught them personal love for God and impersonal love for all mankind. So they had gone pretty far in their spiritual life. They may have not understood a lot of the things, but they had been exposed to it, and yet they did not make it. And now they're going in for legalism. But through virtue love, serve one another. Now what does that mean? How do you serve one another? And we see this in the Bible. I'll tell you how you serve one another. Live and let live. Don't stick your nose in each other's business. That's how you serve one another. Serving one another doesn't mean getting all in somebody's business and saying, I noticed you've sinned here, let me help you. Serving one another means that you live and let live. You don't serve one another by sticking your nose into each other's business. You serve each other by making sure that everyone in the congregation has privacy. And then people in the congregation respecting each other's privacy means you're serving one another. So it's totally different than what most people think. They think that through love, serving somebody means that you have to stick your nose in their business as if you don't have enough problems yourself to deal with. Serving one another means letting them learn the word on their own, in their own privacy, without any intrusion. Without any intrusion of privacy. Now Galatians 5.14. Galatians 5.14. For the whole law can be summed up in a single doctrine, namely... You must love your neighbor as yourself. For the whole law, the whole Mosaic law that they've been trying to follow now can be summed up in one single doctrine. Love your neighbor as yourself. What the Apostle Paul is trying to do is redirect them to spiritual matters. He's trying to redirect them to the filling of the Spirit and the utilization of virtue love. Now how do you love yourself? That spiritual self-esteem as we've noted. 
and its spiritual self-esteem resulting in impersonal love. You must love your neighbor as yourself. You have spiritual self-esteem. From that, you are developing impersonal love for all mankind. But instead of impersonal love, what are these people doing? The Galatians in 5.15. However, since you continually, linear action start, keep on. However, since you continually bite and devour one another, beware that you are not consumed by one another. Now what's happened in the Galatian church is a lot of strife, and that's what happens when legalism moves into a church. Again, however, since you continually bite and devour one another, beware that you are not consumed by one another. And what we have developing in the Galatian church is what develops in many churches. In fact, it will inevitably develop in all churches, even grace teaching churches, because it's part of the bipolar of the old sin nature. On the one hand, legalism. That's part of the old sin nature. On the other hand, antinomianism. And the Apostle Paul will delineate this as we continue. On the one hand, in the church, we have those who have a trend toward legalism. And so, they start looking down their nose at those in antinomianism. Antinomianism includes sins like drug abuse, drunkenness, fornication, adultery. It's antinomian and it's seen. People see it. And then legalism looks down their nose at these people. And so, as a result, this fraction of the church starts fighting with this fraction of the church. And so what breaks out is strife and bitterness, and that's where churches split. And this is what's occurring in the Galatian church. However, since you continually bite and devour one another, there's no virtue love there. Beware that you are not consumed by one another. All the strife of the legalistic churches today, they destroy any chance of escrow blessing for time and eternity. No one can ever learn what the spiritual life is while there's a bunch of strife. In fact, if you have hatred in your heart, you're not filled with the Spirit. And if you're full of strife, you're not filled with the Spirit. And if you're constantly bickering and fighting and constantly being offended, you're not filled with the Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit means it's impossible for you to be offended. And if you walk around with a chip on your shoulder because you've been offended, then you are in strife, you're not filled with the Spirit, and you are trying to bite and devour each other. And that is incorrect. There's no, there is no place for strife in your life, whether it be strife in a church or strife in your family or strife in your friendships. No place for strife in your life. You've got to flush that out through naming those sins and then being filled with the Spirit. Strife will send you down a road of loser because the one thing that strife does is this. You justify your strife. What happens when you get angry with somebody? First thing you'll do is justify it. You'll justify that strife. I have a right to be mad. So and so offended me. So what? So you justify a sin. You justify strife. Self-justification. Then it moves on and through three cogs. Self-deception and self-absorption. Self-justification, self-deception, and self-absorption. And that's exactly the way the sin of strife works. It's the three cogs. You probably have a uh, thing. Of Brad has one right there. The three cogs of arrogance. Self-justification, self-deception, and self-absorption. And what happens is in strife, you say, I have a right to be in strife. I have a right to run down this person because they did me wrong. And then you deceive yourself into saying, well, sometimes people even deceive themselves into saying, I did nothing wrong. And you can even confront them and say, oh, remember when you said this about me? And they'll say, I never said that. This is self-deception. 
self-absorption, totally and completely filled with themselves. And this is what strife does. And this is what is happening in the Galatian church. Actually, Galatian churches. There's more than one church of Galatia. So some people actually lust for strife. You can see that on Jerry Springer. And such will never receive eternal rewards. People who lust for strife, people who lust to always be right, and people who lust to fight to be right. They have to fight for their honor, as it were. But there's no honor in strife. And as a result, no spiritual reward, because you spend all your time out of fellowship. Verse 16, But I say, live by means of the Spirit. What's that mean? Live by means of the filling of God the Holy Spirit, and you will not carry out the lust patterns of the old sin nature. When you're filled with God the Holy Spirit, you're not going to carry out the old sin nature. When you've named your sin to God, disregarded and forgot that sin, or actually just disregarded that sin, you won't function under self-justification, self-deception, and self-absorption because you don't have to. You're filled with the Spirit. And that is spirituality. Live by means of the filling of the Spirit and you will not carry out the lust patterns of the old sin nature. And so now in Galatians 5.17 we have an internal conflict listed. There's an internal conflict within the believer. And that conflict is very simple. There's a book on it over, over there on the shelf. It's called God the Holy Spirit versus the Old Sin Nature. And so this is part of it. Galatians 5.17 For you see, the sin nature has desires opposed to the Spirit. And the Spirit opposed to the old sin nature. And it's a constant battle you're going to have until the day you drop dead or till the day the resurrection occurs, one or the other. We're always going to have a battle in our soul between the old sin nature and the filling of the Spirit. And when you're tempted, you may succumb to sin. Therefore, you're not filled with the Spirit. And the old sin nature takes control. And then when you name that sin, you're back filled with the Spirit. So there's an internal conflict, an internal warfare going on within our own bodies. For you see, the sin nature has desires opposed to the Spirit, and the Spirit opposed to the sin nature. For these are in constant opposition to each other, so that you cannot do what you want. Now these Galatians are going in for legalism. They've forgotten all about the filling of the Spirit, and they can't do what they want. They're trying to serve God through the Mosaic Law, and they can't do it. And they can't do what they want. Why? Because of the weakness of the flesh. And they will never have the filling of the Holy Spirit so long as they continue to try to be spiritual through the law, through feeling sorry for sins, through uh, doing all sorts of weird things like circumcision for spirituality, all of which is in conflict to the filling of the Spirit because they're trying to be spiritual through the energy of the flesh and actually trying to be spiritual through the old sin nature. Now in Galatians 5.18 But since you receive leading under the authority of the Spirit you are not under the law. But since you receive leading under the authority of the Spirit you are not under the law. Therefore when you're filled with God the Holy Spirit you can execute this unique spiritual life. It's the only means by which you can execute this unique spiritual life. It is to be filled with God the Holy Spirit. How is one filled with God the Holy Spirit? Name your sins to God. 1 John 1, 9, If we name our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. And when we do so, then we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. Then we can live our unique spiritual life. All of this is very basic for us, but part of Galatians. So Galatians 5.18 But since you receive leading under the authority of the Spirit you're not under the law. That means spirituality is not based on the law. You're not spiritual because you sit around on Sunday and do nothing. That's part of the Mosaic Law, the Sabbath. You're not spiritual because of anything you do. 
You're not spiritual if you follow certain aspects of the law. You're not spiritual if you follow human taboos. What makes you spiritual is simply the filling of God the Holy Spirit. And the Galatians have forgotten that. So the Spirit and the law are mutually exclusive. You can't have one foot in the law and one foot in the Spirit. If one foot's in the law, you're not filled with the Spirit. And that's part of heresy. When one foot's in the law, you're in heresy, as we will note. And when you're in heresy, you'll never be filled with the Spirit. That's because you refuse to accept the doctrine that is being taught. You absolutely refuse to do it. You see it with your very own eyeballs. You see that you need to separate from legalism. You see it with your own eyeballs, but you still have a problem with it. And that means you're going in for heresy. And it means you've rejected doctrine. And rejection of doctrine is wrongdoing. And you'll never be filled with the Spirit if you reject the Word of God. Never. Because as soon as you name your sin, guess what? Still in your thinking, you've rejected the doctrine of grace. If you reject the doctrine of grace, you'll never ever be filled with the Spirit. It's part of heresy. And heresy is one of those things called wrongdoing, adikia. And it's one of those subtle things that... Well, you could, teach, you could even teach rebound and go into heresy. For example, I've known people come out of Baraka Church and they teach rebound on the one hand, but then they set a date for the rapture. Setting a date for the rapture is heresy. And because they're in heresy, they are in total arrogance and they'll never rebound their arrogance. So they're always out of fellowship. They're in a heresy. And this is something that has, even though they teach rebound, and I know some churches that teach rebound, but then they've gone, a little yeast leavens the whole loaf. All it takes is a little bit. And you see, what I'm saying is they're too arrogant to name the heresy, which is sin, wrongdoing. It's worse than sin. It's wrongdoing. They'll never acknowledge that they're out of line by setting a date to the rapture or setting a date for the resurrection, ex anastasis. They'll never, never admit that. One pastor went up to one pastor in Oklahoma City he came up to my pastor with the idea that the Ameri America was going to be part of the King of the West and Russia was going to be the great beast, the great bear of the North and all this. And if the resurrection would have occurred at that time, well, maybe that would have been true. But he, was, he wasn't saying it as if. He was saying, this is what it is. The eagle is USA. The bear is Russia. And he showed this to my pastor as if my pastor needed to learn something from him. And my pastor looked at him and said, you're just arrogant. You can't set a date for the rapture. It might occur a thousand years from now for all you know. You're just being arrogant. And the way he was, you know, he didn't put up with any heresy. So he walked away with the tail between his legs and he still thinks he's right. Till this day, he thinks he's right. Heresy. And since he's in heresy, he's very rarely filled with the Spirit, if at all. Because it's, it's wrongdoing and he'll never come around to naming it. Now, he'll name a sin, for example. He might uh, commit some sin and name it. He might talk about somebody and name it. Well, guess what? That wipes the whole slate clean, including his heresy. But as soon as he goes back into his study and looks at Revelation again, he goes right back into heresy just like that and right outside the filling of the Spirit. He doesn't know how to, he's not going to name that sin. He's right there. He's always right there. And the same goes with strife. You're always right in strife, which makes it deadly and makes it very serious. Or you're always right in heresy, which makes it very, very serious. So now Galatians 5.19. Now the works of the sin nature are obvious. Such a sort as these. Now the Apostle Paul is going to give us four categories of sexual sins here. It's not a complete list. We've had the complete list under our study of hermodiology. But the Apostle Paul will give us a partial list of four sexual sins. Adultery. That's the old sin nature, of course. Fornication. Adultery is when you are, are married and have sex outside of marriage. Fornication is when you are two unmarried people and you have sex outside of marriage. Mental adultery. Mental adultery, our Lord talked about that in Matthew. It is sin. Commit adultery with your thinking. And you can do that. And people do it all the time and it's sin. 
And then he gives us the last part, lasciviousness, and that's a whole category of the old sin nature. So what has the Apostle Paul done up until this point? He has laid into legalism. And he has uh, really ripped them apart, especially his resounding uh, ending to the uh, th- thrashing of legalism was when I wish I would just cut. I wish they would castrate themselves. That was the resounding end of the end of his great shellacking of the legalists. Now he's going to have to balance it out a bit and say, "Now I know there's some of you that aren't legalists. There are some of you that go in for adultery and fornication." and lasciviousness. You have a different trend of the old sin nature. Now it's your turn. So adultery, fornication, mental adultery, and lasciviousness. Now Galatians 5.20. In Galatians 5.20, he gives four categories of sin. One sin is toward God. The other sin is toward self. The third sin is toward others. And the fourth is sin toward the Word. We will note these four categories. Idolatry. Idolatry is sin toward God. And what is idolatry? How do you bring it into today's terminology? Anything that is more important than the Word of God is your idol. Anything that is more important than the Word of God is your idol. If a television show right now is more important than the Word of God, that's your idol. If a football game is more important than the Word of God or a soccer game or whatever games they have, that's your idol. I'm not saying you can't uh, participate in those things, but you better have your priorities straight. And you better make time for the Word. If you can't make the time at, from 7 to 8, make it on your own at some other time. Most people don't, but you should. Make time for the Word. If you don't, you're an idolatrous. Anything that is more important than the Word of God becomes your idol. Secondly, drug addiction. That's pharmacaea. And I'm not talking about prescription drugs. I'm talking about street drugs. And that's where we get our English word pharmacy. Drug addiction is sin. Crack cocaine, marijuana, cocaine, all those street drugs are sin. Prescribed drugs from a doctor to help some type of ailment is completely fine. So drug addiction, pharmacaea. Now what, what type of sin is that? We saw a sin toward God, idolatry. Drug addiction is sin toward self. You're harming yourself. Sin toward self. Then we have the word emulations. What is that? Emulation is am, ambitious and envious rivalry. And that's sin. And that's sin toward others. Emulation, ambitious and envious rivalry. Sin toward God, idolatry. Sin toward self, drug addiction. Sin toward others, emulations, ambitious and envious rivalry. Wrath, that's that's also a sin toward others. Wrath, wrath is being angry and mad and having emotional outbursts without knowing the facts. You assume something and just go off the handle. That's wrath. You don't even have all the facts yet. It's irrational. Yet you're going to get mad. And you're going to display wrath. It's sin. Emotional outburst without knowing the facts. Strife. Strife is when you begin to organize factions. You get friends on your side. You come up with conspiracies. Strive, organize faction, getting friends on your side, and then you come up with all types of bad things about the person you don't like, oftentimes lies. Then seditions. Seditions is also sin toward others. And sedition is division among believers that are not based on doctrinal differences. These are Jerry Springer type differences. Sedition. Divisions among believers that are not based on doctrinal differences. They're just mad at petty things and they're going to have a petty little fight and fight it out constantly. Seditions. And that's sin. Then we get to the one that I harped on a moment ago. Heresies. Heresies is a sin. 
And actually heresies is not only a sin, it's one of those that goes over into the category of adakia, meaning wrongdoing. Heresy. What is heresy? Heresy is holding an opinion that is contrary to the Word of God. Holding an opinion contrary to the Word of God. And most believers today are practicing some form of heresy. They don't want to know the Word. And so therefore, they come up with their own ideas. Sometimes people try to adjust evolution with the Word of God. That's a heresy. And again, you try to predict the rapture. That's heresy. Not even the angels in heaven even know when the second advent is going to occur, much less the first. That's found in Matthew. So these are heresies, holding to an opinion that is contrary to the Word of God. Now, when you're a young believer, you might hold to all types of heresies, but you can get out of it from grace because remember, when you name a sin that you know is a sin, it wipes out all the others. And eventually, you might be able to push out that heresy. But if you latch on to a heresy and you're stubborn and stiff-necked and you don't want to get away from it and you want to uh, uh, stiff your neck at God and say, I'm going to believe this no matter what the Bible says, you're in heresy and you're not filled with the Spirit. And many people do that, especially people who hold on to their former legalism or just hold on to it and never want to give it up. They're under heresy. Holding to an opinion that is contrary to the uh, Word of God, and that's category number four, and that's sin toward the Word. So again, sin toward God, idolatry. Sin toward self, drug addiction. Sin toward others, those three we listed, and sin toward the word, heresy. Now in Galatians 5.21. Galatians 5.21. Here we're going to have mental attitude sins along with outer sins listed. Envyings. Envying is a mental attitude sin. It's inner. You can envy somebody and smile at them. It's inner. And they might not even know your envious thought whatsoever. But you have it, and it's sin, and God definitely knows. Envyings. Murders. Now that's an overt sin. Envyings. Murders. Overt sin. Drunkenness. Overt sin. People make a big deal out of the overt sin because they can see you stumbling around, etc. Murders. Drunkenness. Then we have nocturnal and riotous parties. Now what's that? It doesn't mean you can't have a late night party as long as you don't get drunk and do drugs, etc. It doesn't mean you can't have a late night party. What it, this is referring to the wild parties of the ancient world. It was referring to things that the Galatians loved to do. When they had their weekend come up, when they had their days off of work, whenever it was, they, as unbelievers, they would go into riotous partying. They would get drunk and they would do drugs, all sorts of drugs, probably some of the same type people take today. And, as, and in the ancient world, since they worshipped many, many different gods, this drug abuse and this drunkenness and this riotous living, as it were, in the middle of the night, they also asked for demon contact. Many of them during this, as unbelievers, would become demon-possessed. You can watch the uh, Discovery Channel even today or National Geographic and look at tribes in Africa and watch this stuff. They have riotous parties and they do drugs and they lather themselves up like a Pentecostal and throw themselves all around and some of them actually become demon-possessed. That's what the Galatians were used to. And now that they're believers, well, they still have a tendency to want to go back to some riotous party. They want to go out and partying. They want to go out and get drunk and get high. And that's sin. And Apostle Paul just reminding them, hey, stop doing that. You're believers now. You don't need to do that. So drunkenness, nocturnal, and riotous parties, and other similar things. And why, why does he say in other similar things? What he's telling them is, I just did not cover all of hermartiology. I just touched on some things that I think you're weak in. And he's saying, you know, some of you might have other areas, but we went over hermartiology is what, that is the doctrine of sin, is what Paul's telling them, and other things. Then he goes on to say, I am warning you. 
As I warned you before, this is repetition for them, and a lot of this is repetition for you, but repetition's good because these people forget all the time, just as we do. I am warning you as I warned you before. Those who habitually, that means constantly, those who habitually and without restraint practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. What's that mean? Does that mean they're not saved? Absolutely not. They're saved. It means they're not going to inherit eternal rewards. They're not going to inherit their eternal rewards. And why? Because of their sin? Well, that's a sideshow. The real reason why is because they're not filled with God the Holy Spirit. And the same person who's out getting drunk and partying all the time is going to end up in the same position as the very self-righteous person who holds on to the heresy of legalism. The person who goes out and gets circumcised and tries to follow the law will see no inheritance. We get that from the earlier verse. People who are wrath, who are filled with strife, wrath, envy, people who cause factions and disturbances, people who cause seditions and conspiracies, people who try to pull people away from doctrine, these people who consistently and constantly do that will not receive eternal reward, will not have the inheritance of the kingdom of God. doesn't mean you're not saved. You're going to heaven. Jesus Christ died on the cross as a substitute for you. And when you believe in Christ, you're heaven bound. And it doesn't depend on who and what you are. Once you get the idea that you can commit a sin that shocks God so much that he's going to ban you from heaven, you're in heresy. You can't shock God. God knew you in eternity past. God knew you billions and billions of years ago. And he knew what you would do through this whole life. He knew every sinful thought you would have. He knew every time you would get mad and angry without all the facts. He knew every time you would commit adultery or fornication or even go into some form of heresy. He knew when you would experiment with drugs and do some drug abuse. He knew when you would get drunk. He knew every time you would commit whatever is your favorite sin. And guess what? He still sent Jesus Christ to the cross knowing all that about you, which means he's not shocked about your sins. And when you believe in Christ, you receive eternal life. But this is not talking about your eternal life. What's it talking about? Inheritance. You will not inherit. Inherit what? The re eternal rewards that are due to you in the kingdom of God. And if you execute your spiritual life by remaining filled with God the Holy Spirit, it's not to say you'll never commit one of these sins. We've all committed at least one of these sins, probably more than one. Probably most of them we've committed. And we don't need to get personal about it, but I'm, I know all of us have had wrath. I know I have, and I know all of you have. Wrath, anger. We've all gotten mad. Sin. And we've all been involved in strife and gossip and maligning and judging. And we've all had a rivalry at some point. We've all done these things, but you see, these things are the inner these are things that you can think so people don't make such a big deal out of it. They're the more sophisticated sins, as it were, in their mind. Well, mental adultery. We can all commit mental adultery. Nobody would even know it. But God knows it. Now, does that mean that because you've committed these once, twice, three times, even a hundred or a thousand times or a million times, that mean you're not going to receive your inheritance? No, it has to do with how much time you log in the filling of God the Holy Spirit. See, when you learn how to fly an airplane, you have a log book. You're not always flying the airplane, but when you fly it, you write down in your log book how long you flew it, take off, landed, and you write down what you did. Maybe you did some stalls or something. And you keep a log book for yourself so that you can uh, one day brag and say, well, I have... Uh, a thousand hours of flying time or something like that. And so if the same holds true when you're filled with the Spirit, you're logging that time. Now you're not writing it down, but God keeps a record of it. And when you're filled with the Spirit and growing in grace, that's when you are executing the spiritual life and you will have your eternal rewards. But what will keep you from it? If you constantly, see there's that word, if you habitually and without restraint constantly practice such things 
If you constantly live under the old sin nature, you're not going to receive an inheritance. If you constantly function under heresy and think that you can have one foot in legalism and one foot in grace, that's heresy. You'll never be filled with the Spirit, and if you are, it won't last very long, and you'll receive no eternal reward. And if you think that you can go on and uh, be a drug addict your whole life, you'll never receive any eternal reward. It's not to say that you can have, you can see a drug addict and they could go straight to spiritual maturity. Why? Because they rebounded and they stopped doing those things and they remain filled with the Spirit and not the spirits. Same with drunkenness. You can get drunk every now and then and, and it's a sin and you'll be punished for it, but it does not keep you from your eternal rewards because you've lo you're logging time in the filling of the Spirit once you rebound. But if you constantly and habitually do these things, if you're constantly filled with envy, if you're constantly filled with strife, and that describes most of believers today, at least 99% of believers remain in the old sin nature because they don't even know how to get out of it. They don't even know what 1 John 1, 9 is. They don't know that they need to name their sins in order to be filled with the Spirit. And because of that, guess what they're in? Wrath. Constantly in wrath. Strife. Constantly. Or they just have their favorite sin, whatever it is, nocturnal and riotous parties, drug abuse, whatever they pick as their favorite form of sin, they go all out for it, and they are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, and they will not receive an, internal, an eternal inheritance. And that goes for today probably about 99% of believers. And since it's Friday, I'll cut it short, and we'll be back Sunday. So with your, or at least I will. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning what it means to go to spiritual maturity and concerning the fact that we must log more time in the filling of the Spirit and less time under the old sin nature. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.